Well, good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started this morning with our invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor, Hobbs, pastor Poncho Hobbs is here. He's the pastor at Capitol Hill Church of Christ. He'll lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman uh, Pat Ryan to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? Let's, let's pray. Okay. Lord, we come into your presence. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, you have uh, brought us to this place ready to serve, ready to serve this community. Father, we praise you for all that you've done in each one of us individually. You brought us through many dangers, toils, and snares. Lord, you have brought this city through good times, through difficult times, and here we are. Father, on this day, we recognize and honor and thank you for this assembly of servants, those who have sacrificed, especially in recent days, as our city went through uh, a difficult emergency. Father, we thank you for their spirit of dedication, for their sacrifice on our behalf. When the rest of us were, were resting comfortably, they were out there, Lord, enduring hardship for us. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon them and their families. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless our city, that you will uh, continue to protect and shield us from evil, that you will bring abundance Father, there are so many families that are hurting these days, that are in doubt, that are in fear, that are wondering about what the future will bring. Father, we pray that you will support them and that you will bring them and supply all their needs. Lord, we recognize that we fall short. We recognize that we need your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. Father, we pray that you'll help us to focus on you. Lord, each one of us is different. Each one of us brings something different to the table. And we pray, Lord, that you will guide all the deliberations of these uh, public servants. Father, we pray that you will continue to work so that um, Oklahoma City can continue to be an example and a beacon of unity, of progress, of growth. A community where all are welcome and when you, where you are honored. We pray all these things, Lord, not on our own merits, but we pray in the name of the one whom you sent. We pray, Father for your blessing so that we can go from here to be a blessing to others. And all the people said, Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, the council chambers are full this morning with some very uh, special guests. These are largely our city employees who were employed in a, a very incredible time in our city's history. It's when we got the, the largest snowstorm that anyone could remember. Um, the, the, many of the men and women who have gathered here this morning uh, worked 12-hour shifts for eight days, uh, removing snow under the, the most extreme situations with uh, our citizens abandoning their cars seemingly at will. Um, and creating all sorts of havoc in the city and uh, to the extent that we survived and that city services continued is is a remarkable testament I think to the to the people who have, have gathered here today and we asked you to come by today so we could uh, specifically as a as a council say thank you uh, on behalf of the citizens of Oklahoma City for everything you've done and and um, uh, I, I'd like uh, Mike uh, Giacomo to come forward and, and uh, I guess it, to a certain extent uh, Give us some idea of, uh, of, of the size of this storm and how you guys uh, do, did the best you could to deal with it, Mike. Uh, Mayor and council members, city manager and staff. <clears throat> yes, it was a uh, blizzard of 2009 was an extraordinary event. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 inches of snow is really hard to deal with in all locales here. It's much, much worse simply because we don't have the actual resources that you have in other jurisdictions. However, uh, these folks behind us are the heroes, uh, uh, from shift supervisors to the area supervisors to the truck drivers to the equipment operators, and we always can't forget our, our support staff, uh, data entry operators, dispatchers, and uh, mechanics from uh, General Services Department that all work together working that 12-hour shifts. We put in over 15,000 man hours. A third of that was in overtime, and so uh, all of those things just point to the fact that uh, uh, these guys can get the job done. 
Well, and Mike, let me lead the applause in, in, in showing I appreciate you. Just remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's hope we don't have to do it again. One and done. <laughs> but, but if we do, I know you guys will be ready. So thanks again. Uh, we appreciate you guys uh, 365 days of the year. But uh, under these extraordinary circumstances, we did want to bring you by. And if anyone else in the council has anything they'd like to say, yeah, Pat. Well, I just briefly, I'd like to compliment them on a, a fact that uh, they were able to do this work under extraordinary conditions for very long hours without, any, without a serious personal injury. I mean, I think that's a, a, a real testament to their competence and their professionalism and, and the effort they took to do a good job and do it safely. And I, I want to commend them on that. I think it's an it's a, it's a extraordinary uh, accomplishment. Well, I'll just echo that. I, we all had a few people that complained, our citizens that complained about some of the routes not being cleared in a timely manner. But uh, overwhelmingly, we had compliments from the citizens in saying that the uh, they appreciated the work that was done, and although it was uh, uh, happened at a, at a couldn't happen at a worse time, uh, right at Christmas Eve and Christmas, they were still uh, able at some point to get around and see their families, and how much they appreciated the work that was done. Uh, and, and the abandoned car issues had to be a monumental problem to you. I don't know how how you got the streets cleared as as well as you did with as many cars as there was sitting out there uh, right in the roadway. So uh, accolades to you very much from. Uh, from the citizens. They, they certainly appreciate what you did. I'd just like to personally thank whoever cleared Meridian from about Northwest 30th to the airport uh, because uh, my family flew in from California Christmas night and uh, you all had that road cleared and there were vehicles strewn all over the road and the road wasn't just a straight line but it was cleared and uh, tremendous creativity and uh, thank you for your dedication in, in dangerous situations and God bless each one of you. Mayor, it was reported sometime during the storm that uh, there were 30 trucks out on uh, operation. And if we really had the trucks that we needed to, to address the size of this storm, it was said that we would have needed 10 times the number of trucks. And I think what that says, that certainly says to me, is that that also means we needed 10 times the workforce to address that. And, and you folks stepped up tenfold. And, and did a job that makes this city really become a big league city. We talk about the thunder, and we rave on the thunder, and, and that sure gives us an image of a big league city, but it's, it's you folks that really stand behind us and make us proud to be the big league city that we are. Thank you very much. Yeah. Meg? Uh, just a quick comment following on Sam's, I guess. It's just really heartwarming to see the team spirit that's in this room, and I listen to you all outside, just loads of chatter and excitement and it's obvious to tell that you all work like a really well-oiled machine and we're so grateful uh, for what you did for our city and uh, thank you very much and do hope you were able to spend some time with your families over the holidays and you certainly allowed those of us that had family in from out of town to do that as well so thank you very very much for your efforts skip and now since we all know how grateful we are for all the hard work that you do we're going to do everything that we can do to secure those positions so we can continue to have the services that we need in this city. Thank you. Well, I couldn't agree with everything that's, uh, with everything that's been said more. I, I personally appreciate it. I know what a tough job this w was for you and what a great way you stepped up to it. And, and I, I, as Meg said, I think the teamwork aspect of it is very not good to see. It's good to see how the relationships that you guys have with each other, and I think that showed in the way you did your job, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Cleared uh, 5,500 lane miles of road under those circumstances. Our, our hat's off to you. I don't know how you did it. But appreciate it, Jim. Good job. These guys did it all. They're, they're, they're well trained, and, and if you've never been down there during a storm, it's, it's like a military operation. Mr. Giacomo ha, ha, hasn't trained. I don't know if he's, if he's, in a, he's running like a, just like a, I guess in the, in the Army. We, you, everybody knows where they're supposed to be and, and what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to be there, and, and it's well executed. So thank you to all. All right. Well, we're going to move on with the council meeting. Are we going to let them stay, or we have to put them back on the street? I think so. they probably like to, uh, to probably <laughs> okay. There's so many of you. We're gonna 
we'll go ahead and let you leave. I mean, there's going to be some level of noise, and we'll probably wait until you guys have cleared out before we continue the rest of the meeting. But again, thank you very much for what you've done. Item four, the council agenda. These are the journal of council proceedings. Item A is to receive the journal of council proceedings for January 5th. And item B is to approve the journal of council proceedings for December 22nd. All right, comments or questions on this? All right, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Then we have requests for uncontested continuances. None this morning. Okay, anybody else have any? Yeah, I'm not sure whether this is the appropriate place or not. We have an item in the consent docket. Uh, uh, v I D point one, and it's an ordinance introducing uh, and setting for final hearing uh, a case uh, P U D thirteen ninety three. The planning commission will consider it uh, on the fourteenth of January. Uh, and I uh, talked to the uh, developer's representative yesterday, and we would like to defer this uh, final hearing uh, at the council until at least February twenty third. All right, that's item 6D1. Yes, Your Honor. Is that what you said, 6D1? Yes, 6D1, it's a PUD 1393. All right. Got that, Francis? Do we need to vote on that specifically? Yes. Do you want February 23rd? Yes, ma'am. Would you like to go into March? And well, uh, February 23rd, and we may have to delay it further. It's, it's a, a very controversial project. I suspect there will be much discussion at the... Uh, Planning Commission level, and it may not come out as quickly as the uh, developer hopes it will. This is the second time through the Planning Commission, so there's a lot of interest in the project. Okay. Well, why don't we wait till we get to the cons to the consent docket to defer that? Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. That's all right. If if we can't do it now, um, let's recess the council meeting. Convene the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are three items. All right. Any comments or questions on the MFA? Uh, just on MFAA, it's a further step in our uh, Northwest Library uh, project that everybody's uh, looking forward to. Uh, the groundbreaking has been set in anticipation of the contract being let in a prompt matter for March 30th. The Metropolitan Library people chose that date, and everybody's excited out in that part of the city, and we're looking forward to it. All right. Cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Adjourn our CMFA, convenes the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. There are two items. Okay, any comments or questions on the PPA? All right, cast your votes. Pass unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA and then reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. And I don't know. All right, we have a motion and a second. And um, Pat's going to make a motion to defer item 6D1. Any other comments or questions on any other items that somebody would like to speak about? Okay. Okay. Mayor, I just had a comment on uh, C2. All right. Gary, you want to get started with G&R? Well, just a, just a couple of comments. Um, the, on item G, this is the Bricktown Fire Station. I'm glad to see that one finally moving. It's been a long time coming. We've had land issues down there and, and environmental issues, and um, this was actually started in a bond project that I, when I was the chief, so... It's uh, been out there for a while. I'm, I'm certainly glad to see that going. And on R, kind of the same thing. R is a um, has to do with our 800 um, megahertz trunk radio system. We built that years ago uh, with the um, 
with the plan that it had enough capacity to uh, allow other communities to uh, tie into that, not only for a revenue stream for us, but a communications uh, interoperability with uh, the metro area here. Uh, and today we have uh, Bethany and Yukon coming into that system. So uh, the system is, is uh, certainly, not only is it beneficial to us, but it's proven what we said it would do many years ago. Okay. All the councilmen's on item R, we really need to, need to do an amendment to item R and make it retroactive back to July 1. Instead of from January 12th, the date should be retro back to July 1 of 09. Okay. So if we could get a we'll, okay, we'll take care of that in a moment. So that's six, uh, both okay. one and two? Yes, sir. Six R, one, one and two. Uh, Sam, item S. Thank you, Mayor. This is the item regarding Crystal Lake, pristine little lake out at Southwest 15th and MacArthur. Someday, it's going to be a, a, a beautiful part, part of our uh, park system, I, I, I believe. I've been out there probably the last eight summers, part of a whiz kids uh, summer activity, 500 children and probably that many adults each of the last eight years, and it just lends itself wonderfully to, to groups like that. And th that's my point. We're going to go out for requests for proposals on the uh, maintenance and operation and programming of this lake, which I think is a, is, is a good move. And it has been the, uh, as, as it says in our, our little background paper, that uh, the primary beneficiaries for the past however many years were have been disadvantaged, disabled, and at-risk urban youth. And I just ask that that same consideration as we go out for proposals uh, be included in our, uh, our request for proposals, the continued use for groups like that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Meg, C2. C2. Uh, just a, really a, maybe a question uh, of the manager. This is a resolution you know, authoring us, us to purchase under state contracts. Yes. And two is for uh, PC standardization, desktops and laptops up to two and a half million dollars. Is there any wiggle room in, is that a place that we might be able to postpone some of those purchases and save some dollars? Yeah, possibly, it's an authorization. We'll, we are being judicious in our, our purchase, so this is a blank authorization, but we, we are, are cutting back on, on capital and this will probably, well it will probably, it will be an area that we'll, we'll be looking at very closely. Some, uh, it's always nice to upgrade, but sometimes we can put that off just a little bit, so thank you. All right, we have a couple of items we want to have, have some, uh, uh, decisions about later. Uh, Pat, you want to defer item 6D1 to February 23rd? Yes, Ryan. That's just the final hearing at the, at the council. I'm assuming that it will go through the planning commission and be ready for our uh, review at that point. Second. Okay. So I would defer the, the, the uh, final hearing at, at the uh, council until February 23rd. All right. Cast your votes. Item is deferred. Thank you, Your and Honor. Gary, do you want to make the amendment to uh, retro 6R1 and 2 to be retro to July 1? I'll move. Can I do both of Second. Okay. We'll cast your votes on that amendment. Passed unanimously. We already have a motion and a second on the consent docket. Any other comments or questions on the other list? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Well, the concurrent docket. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on the concurrent docket? Mayor, just a couple. Of, for the folks in Ward 3, uh, the uh, Maps for Kids projects for Arthur Elementary, uh, that's moving forward, and also for the Buchanan School. Uh, I know the folks out in the Musgrave Pennington area and Corbin Park are interested in that. Uh, the final plans and specifications are to be completed in April of 2010. Just further uh, proof that uh, the Maps for Kids projects are moving forward and, and the schools will be done as promised. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thanks. Any other comments or questions on the concurrence topic? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. We're on item eight. These are items that require separate votes. The first is a series of items from the Traffic Commission. The first one is in Ward 7. It's uh, near Northeast 48th Street and Stiles. Skip, you good with these no parking anytime signs? Well, is there someone that could give me a uh, a reason what this is? What's driving it? I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get uh, Dennis Flowers to come in okay. and uh, update us on what happened at the traffic commission. Maybe not. 
Maybe not. Okay. <clears throat> Are we talking about 8A? A. Councilman, it appears it's just a request of a, a citizen um, to try to improve the traffic flow around the school at pickup time. <clears throat> Would you prefer that this... So to remove the no parking sign? Uh, that's correct. To re remove the no parking anytime restriction. Um, would you prefer that we pull this or defer it? I would like to uh, look at this again, if we have a little bit more time. Okay. Defer this, Dennis. Okay. You want to make a motion on deferring that item? Yes. I would like to defer it for 30 days. All right. Second. What is that? Okay, that'll be, let's do February 16th. February 16th. Or can we do it February 23rd? Okay. You want to make that motion, Skip? Yes. Do you have a second? Second. Okay. We're voting to defer item 8A1 to February 23rd. Cast your votes. And it is deferred. Item 8A2 is in Ward 2. And again, it's um, removal of a, of a sign. This one, uh, no vehicles in excess of two axles on uh, North Robinson. Sam? Mayor, uh, what I understand is that uh, it, it was a private driveway and we're not able to restrict that, so we're just rescinding that action. Okay, so it's, a, it's a three block area on North Robinson, Northwest 63rd and Northwest 66th. All right, you want to make a motion to approve this? Yes, so move. All right, cast your votes. We're voting on item 8A2. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 8B starts a series of two items that deal with the use tax for maps. Item 8B is the um, ordinance, and item 8C is the resolution. Right. Item uh, 8B is, is the ordinance enacting the use tax. Mm -hmm. We've historically always put in the use tax can be implement, uh, enacted by uh, council vote, and it's, it's the companion item to the, the, the maps three uh, sales tax, and it, it's, it's for the use tax collections. Um, on that, we've, uh, we can enact a use tax up to the level of the sales tax rate that, that we have that's out there. Uh, this is the ordinance that enacts the, the tax, and, and we really need to do this. It has to be in, in effect uh, before, the ordinance has to be passed before January 15th. All right, let's go ahead and vote on item 8B, and then I think we're going to have some discussion on item 8C. All right, I have a motion and a second on item 8B. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. We're, uh, we do need the emergency for this. All right. Cast your votes on the emergency, and it passes also. All right. We're on to item 8C, and uh, Pat and I have had some discussion. Pat thinks our, our vocabulary here may be a little limiting in, um, in, in what we uh, intend to do at the use tax. Do you want to explain further? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I, I know this is a, a, a repeat of what we have done in the past for MAPS taxes. We had a resolution that adopts specific use support. But I would suggest, in view of the upcoming budget problems, we hold this money in reserve and use it as is necessary as we go forward to alleviate some of the problems that we may incur because of the budget shortfall. Mm -hmm. uh, and in other words, instead of setting specific uses in this resolution, I would either like to, to reword the resolution that leaves it uh, open-ended for the time being or uh, remove the resolution entirely from well, if we remove the resolution entirely, in effect, what we could do is just place all of this into the annual budget process. So, I mean, this, this resolution is not necessary for us to annually review and, and, and take it as necessary. And in these financial times, I don't have a problem with that. Or if you want to make a specific amendment to the resolution itself, we could do that. So I, I think, uh, in my view, it, it would be better just to leave it open okay. and, and, and have the uh, latitude to lo use the money. Not lose it. Use the money where it's most necessary as we go forward in the upcoming years. Uh, well, I assume we could strike the resolution and ask Jim to put it in the budget process. Yes, and let's be clear. I want to be clear on this: is, is that it's not necessary to have this resolution as a part of the ordinance. The ordinance is, is a separate. This is an internal thing, kind of directing the use of those uh, uh, funds as we've done in the past. And we do not need an or, uh, a resolution. The resolution, uh, as is, is stated, we could handle this on an annual basis through the budgeting process, or we can come back and later decide 
uh, where we'd like to pass a resolution in the future. I, I think that does two things for us. One, it gives us some latitude as we go forward. And secondly, then the, the, it gives the, the council an opportunity to discuss and thoroughly vet each application of this money as we go forward. I think both those two things are important. Mm -hmm. So I would, if we can just strike this resolution, that would be my uh, Any my other preference. comments? Yeah, I, I don't mind having flexibility and, and latitude, but I think that, I think the intent uh, of this would be to, like Jim said, give guidance and to give some kind of a framework as to, as to the way we use it. And because of the promises that were made in association with this, I would like something, whether it's this one, an abbreviated one, or a completely different resolution to come forward, to say that this council is on record as saying that that we do stand by what was said during the campaign and we are going to hold that as our standard. Um, could we change it any time? Yeah, we could change it any time. But I think that I think being on record, being vocal about it, being public about it, I think is very important as opposed to taking this money, putting it into the budget process where it just kind of gets mixed and mingled and used. Well, I think we need to be services. careful that doesn't I don't. I wouldn't anticipate it getting mixed up in the general revenue budget. I would suspect that each and every use of this would be a specific action of the council, whether it was to, you know, public safety, whether it was additional uh, monies to prevent layoffs or furloughs. Uh, I think we need to keep the flexibility as we go forward. The next couple of years are going to be difficult budget years. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think what Pat's trying to accomplish is to, is to change the, 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 the intent that, that I verbalized during the campaign and that you're speaking to now, as much as it is that we don't necessarily know what emergencies we might take might take place in the next few years with the uh, current economic crisis, and we need to, to keep our options open. So, uh, is, so every dollar of the use tax money will come before the council to be voted on to be spent? A actually, they are anyway. But <laughs> this is a, basically a direction for staff, and so we can, we can re reserve that. For example, on, on the maps for kids use tax, all of that is gone for public safety capital. But each year we bring forth what our plan is to spend that out of the use tax. So this isn't particularly. I think Brian's concern though is it just doesn't get lost. You know that it isn't brought to the council's attention. This yeah. is the use tax. This is what we intended to do. This yeah. is what the voters were told. I, mean, I think all of that needs to somehow be. And, and I think too. I think, I think if it's if it's if if the scope of what it can be used for is virtually unlimited, then I think you you begin to pick apart little bit here and there. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's the idea of if when you have a hundred dollar bill in your pocket, you know, you don't, it doesn't just disappear, but you start breaking that down into ones and it just, pretty soon you don't have it anymore. And that's, mm -hmm. that's my fear with this is that it would be picked apart to a point that it really doesn't accomplish much of anything. It just kind of gets used yeah. up in the process. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I think it would be easy to lose our focus, you know, if, if, if uh, it's, it's been easier in the past because we've had a resolution and a, and a verbal agreement and then a resolution that kind of kept us in line. Anybody else have any comments on how we could best deal with this? Yeah, Larry. I see nothing wrong with leaving this resolution the way it is to show our intent of what we intend to do with it. I think it's uh, consistent with what's been said in the past. And I think it alleviates the, the possibility that thing would happen uh, that happened similar with the IMSA, uh, $3 million, where that was originally intended to go to public safety. And then because of a legitimate budget emergency, those funds for this pro uh, past year have been diverted to other uses. Is that correct, Jim? Uh, well, actually, they've been used to, to retain public safety. But, but yes, it's not. It, they've been used to retain public safety. And other things also. No. Well, we use it as a part of it. We use a million of it to close the budget gap. Yeah, that's gonna, what I mean. Yeah, yes, okay. Sir. And so I think our intent, uh, the intent of, of the original use tax idea, to use it uh, uh, for, uh, with, uh, in conjunction with MAPS 3, mm -hmm. was to use it for public safety. And I think this gives the flexibility. It doesn't have to just go for salaries in public safety, but it can also go for public safety capital equipment. I think this should stay. Well, but uh, in order to well, uh, maintain that uh, consistency. Uh, but the only I problem I have with that, Larry, is that it, it takes away the flexibility. We express no intent to use that money for anything other than capital or public safety salaries. And there may be some issues as we go forward that would require, that would provide a higher use for that money someplace else. I don't know what they might be. I have no problem using it to, to supplement public safety salaries. But I think we ought to do that at, at, at a, at, with a specific action with a specific result in mind rather than just intending we're going to do it. I think it, 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 it limits us because if we came back a, a year or two from now and wanted to spend some money, for instance, on, on zoning or animal control because of a specific important need, we didn't express that intent. 
So we're going to have some people saying, well, you, you've backed off, you've changed your mind. I think we, it, we, we benefit most from leaving it open. So this council, it's not, it's not going to get lost as long as this council does its job. As long as we are conscientious about watching the disposition of that money, it will be used properly. Public safety, obviously, is important. But using it for capital issues or, or projects is, cons is consistent with what we've done in the past. It's a, it's a single source of money, so it makes sense to use it for capital. However, we're going into some very extraordinary time, and I think we ought to retain the flexibility at the Council here to use that money as, as best needed as we go forward. Meg? May I just make a quick comment? It's kind of a technical comment, but I believe in terms of the money being lost, I believe this ordinance sets up a special account that those use tax funds go into, so it doesn't, you know, just fungibly go into a big That's right. We've already done that. We've already done yeah. that. We know where the money is. We know how much money will be there. So I'm in concurrence with Pat that we ought to retain the flexibility. But I think when, the, when we use the term loss, it's not like we can't find it. We know where it is, but it, it, gets, it gets picked apart. It gets mixed in with other accounts, other uses, and, and, you, and you dilute the, the amount of money. Um, as as uh, my friend Pete says, uh, you know, we, we can make a pig file on any Tuesday morning. We can get five votes to do so. Um, the resolution is is not necessarily a uh, something that's going to handcuff this council. I mean, any Tuesday morning, uh, we can make a vote to, to spend that money. I think mm -hmm. that this this shows our intent as to following through with the, the comments that were made. So I think the idea that that somehow this handcuffs us, I think, is is uh, is going a little bit beyond what. What it really does. This resolution has nothing to do with what we said or commented during the campaign. It talks about public safety salaries to prevent layoffs. That was the intent of this particular resolution. It doesn't have anything to do with the issue you're talking about. I, I see. You're saying it doesn't have anything to do with creating new positions exactly. going forward. Yeah. It just basically says public safety salaries in general. Um, and for instance, if we wanted to extend that to other uh, avenues of, of employment uh, of the city, under this resolution, we couldn't do it. We'd have to go back in and change it. Mayor. Yeah, Skip. What is the urgency as we sit here and talk about this resolution? I understand the, the urgency of passing the, uh, the prior the resolution. Yeah. Where and what is the urgency now as we debate this issue? It sounds like that there is a need to have more time to either you know, look at some of the options that we could be specific about, you know, with some guidance from legal as it relates to this set-aside account under the use. I'm kind of perplexed with this with these statements that people keep saying that it was our intent. Uh, you know, there's one thing that you have in law, and that is, you know, what is the, the written law and what is somebody's hidden behind their mind intent that nobody can read but them. And I just don't want to go forth with this issue of something of this magnitude and, and, and the issues that are so serious as it relates to, to a lot of concerns in the, in the city of Oklahoma City, not just uh, public safety issues, but also very similar to what we just exp we expressed our gratitude this morning to these individuals who were here when nobody else was doing anything, they was doing everything, you know, along with public safety. But at the same time, you know, how do you put them on this here scale of, of economic justice when it comes down to salaries, when it comes down to positions, and you're saying that you can set aside a use tax specifically for one but you don't say anything for the other. And I just think that, you know, I, I agree with Councilman Ryan. I think we need to have some flexibility as it relates to this account, but I think more time need to be devoted to allow us to set some specific mm -hmm. guidelines as to where it can be used. Well, let me suggest a compromise there. What if we deferred this, but the Council's intent would be we are going to have a resolution by the time this budget year ends. In other words, going forward, before July 1, we will have a resolution in place that we're comfortable with. That would not, that would not uh, force us to make a decision today, but it also would not allow three or four or five years to go by and for the, the intent of this council uh, that was in place when the uh, use tax was, was uh, voted upon, uh, our intent to be somehow lost 
uh, with, with, the, with the wake of time. Per, you know, perhaps it would be appropriate for us to express an intent annually uh, at some date certain, maybe prior to the adoption of the final budget, as to what we want to do with use tax going forward. It may be some years that our, our traditional capital expense limitation is, is appropriate. And there may be some years when the money needs to be used for other sources. And perhaps if we did, you know, had a policy or a, not a policy, but a practice of looking at this use tax disposition on an annual basis prior to the adoption of the final budget, we could accomplish what uh, I would like to see accomplished, meet Skip's objections, and perhaps uh, uh, satisfy some of our other colleagues. Well, what about a resolution that will be playing uh, along with the budget that goes forward for July 1, that this resolution be placed at, at that point? Yes. Well, well, that's fine. I, I kind of like the idea of a, of, a, of a resolution on this that coincides with what we finally decide the budget is and how we're going to deal with the budget issues next year. But my question would be, the tax starts accumulating April 1. Does staff need a resolution of a basic Necess a basic kind to put that money somewhere, or can okay. it simply be held? The ordinance collects the money. Is that right? It does, and, and, and we're not going to spend any without direction here, but there are a couple of things I do want to bring up. One of the things that this resolution did spell out was we anticipated using the money to do the administration of the program, just like we did on the, on the previous MAPS vote, where the, the, the oversight of the sports facilities was paid for, and that's anticipated to be about 2 percent of the program about $15 million maybe in that neighborhood anyway. The other thing that we, we uh, brought up last week was the fact that we didn't do public safety cuts this year with the anticipation that the MAPS for kids, or the, not the MAPS for kids, the MAPS for use tax would be available to backfill that. And that's why we, we didn't have public safety cuts, or I'm not recommending public safety cuts. That was our discussion last week. We used some of that money to backfill that, mm -hmm. and so that wouldn't happen. And so that's the plan we're going. And if council's not comfortable with that, then we've got to go back and, and, and rethink some of the things we did last year. No, I think now, the last we, thing we need to do is go back, because we, we voted okay. that in already. Well, we didn't vote that in, but there will be a budget amendment. And so I'm planning on bringing a budget amendment that, that will re reflect that issue uh, to, to not go forward with, with the public safety cuts that we talked about last week and backfill that with, with MAPS, MAPS for Kids Use Tax. Okay. MAPS 3 use. MAPS 3 MAPS 3, three. three. Maps okay. three. I, I, I don't have any problem with that. As long as you bring it back to a separate item, we can discuss it. Uh, we can understand what we're using it for. We know what the amounts we're going to be spending sure. for it. And I think that's an appropriate and, and a, a, a efficient way to administer these dollars okay. rather than just establish it as a sort of a blank check kind of thing. So at this point in time, although we don't have specific instructions for the whole use tax, we will go toward the end of the lease for this fiscal year backfilling those, those public safety cuts and also to begin the administration of the MAPS 3 program. We'll rely on your judgment as, as a city manager to come back and, and tell us what, you, in your opinion, is the best use for this uh, use tax. Okay. Best use for the but, tax. That's the but also, let's, let's have the intent of passing a resolution as part of this budget process. So going forward, there'll be a resolution in place. Yes, sir. Okay. Everybody we right? have to have an abbreviated resolution to get to, to the city manager's concern about the administration costs. We could we could uh, adopt only that portion of this resolution this morning if that's important. I don't know. All right. Crucial that is. Um, I think I'm comfortable with the direction we're going. We'll bring back something to you with a budget amendment uh, uh, on, on both of the, the, the two issues I, I previously brought up. Okay. Everybody good? So do we? Def are we deferring this? Strike it. I think. Strike. I move to strike, strike the item. Okay. okay. Second. All right. Do we vote on the strike? Cast your votes on the strike, and it passes eight to one. We're on to item 8D. This is a revocable permit for Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday uh, Coalition to hold the Martin Luther King Jr. Parade on January 18th, which I guess is Monday. Comments or questions? Uh, no. I move that we pass. Second. All right. Cast your votes on 8D. Passed unanimously. Item 8E deals with a sign in Automobile Alley. This is in Ward 7. Someone who signed up to speak? I believe this is... Okay. Oh, did you say Automobile Alley? I did. No. We forget it's still Broadway, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and I've had some, some discussions with Mr. Elliott Rand and, and his counsel. Um, 
for, for a little bit of clarification, Dennis, could you give us a little bit of, of background as it relates to the, uh, the need in order to, uh, for us to go forth with this, in your opinion, and, and on behalf of, of Mr. Elliott? Yes, sir. Dennis Fox, 522 Colcord Drive, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to give you a little bit of history. This is unique in the sense that uh, this has gone before two different bodies, the design, Downtown Design Review Commission, which is recommended approval. In fact, at the Downtown Design Review Commission, they looked at where the appropriate location was, because at one point it was uh, looked at maybe it'd be better next to the building. After looking at it, they determined the best place to be would be in the amenity zone, and that's where uh, we're asking you to approve it. Went to the Board of Adjustment, got a variance. The Board of Adjustment approved it. And so we're now here on the third leg of uh, our uh, process and asking you to approve a vocal permit. I know there's been some discussion, maybe some concern in regard to uh, what uh, the precedential effect of this would be. Uh, from my standpoint, I don't think this would have any precedent based on the unique facts of this building. And Rand is here, and I'd like for him to speak to that. Uh, this is a building that uh, is on the historical register, uh, built in 1911. Um, we don't want to deface the front, and that's why we're here asking for a sign in the amenity zone. And uh, I think that's why the other two boards and agencies approved it. So, Rand, and this is a picture of it. Good morning, and thanks very much for your time uh, this morning. I thought I might pass this around. This is a photograph, a current photograph showing the Buick building, uh, as Dennis said, built in 1911. What's so special about this building is that um, it is probably one of the few remaining and finest um, examples of neoclassical architecture in downtown. And uh, what makes it so great is the filigree. This is all cast limestone. This was actually built by uh, Detroit from the uh, Buick Motor Company. And you'll notice that the, the name Buick or the sign was actually um, uh, carved in limestone at the top of the building. And so their thoughts in 1911 were that the sign would be on the building but carved into it. Um, at this point, obviously, we're here to talk about um, uh, trying to place a, a sign um, uh, for this business, for this uh, particular location, and the fact that the building is on the National Register of Historic Places, and to the effect that we've done some 200 historic property buildings over 30 years of practice, we find that in dealing with projects like this, um, when you're not able to um, attach a sign to a building without defacing its historic character, the National Park Service standards recommends that things are detached, that they are in fact modern um, uh, implements or, or uh, modern elements that are uh, done as a complement to the historic nature of the building. And that's precisely um, the approach that we've taken. Um, and Dennis, uh, the sign view, I think, question about its, um, its height. Oh, thank you. Um, we actually have created uh, the building sign in this position, and its alignment to the top actually associates with the alignment of a, an artificial below the windows. And when you approach historic buildings with elements like this, the idea is to try to find a complementary point of reference so that they go together. And so that's what we've done here. The sign is 20 feet tall. It is um, suggested and uh, placed in the amenity zone. It's actually narrower than the amenity zone. The amenity zone is uh, four feet. Our sign is three feet in depth. And so it is uh, further from the curb than the amenity zone definition. So that's a little bit of background about uh, the Buick building and its historic nature. I mean, happy to answer questions. Uh, why do you need a sign? Pardon me? Why do you need the sign? It's a great building and it's a great restaurant and it's, uh, it seems like the sign might be uh, uh, Pat, I think uh, in my conversations <laughs> with Keith Paul, he's, uh, uh, Keith and Heather, uh, of course, operate uh, Pops, they operate uh, Cheevers, they operate Iron Star, and they've just opened one in Norman. Um, being in downtown with a retail location is uh, challenging. And uh, Keith uh, has come to me and said, gee, uh, we're doing good. We'd like to feel like we had more presence, uh, a sign that would help us uh, create more visibility in this location and uh, help them sustain uh, business growth as they go forward. So it's a business proposition. They feel like it's necessary to help them 
uh, continue to do business by having more visibility. Were there other uh, design attempts to find a place not on public right away for that sign? Um, we actually started in the original uh, proposal to place it um, on the northwest corner of the building, one foot from the facade of the building itself. And uh, that was what we actually took to the Downtown Design Review Committee in the initial uh, presentation. And in that discussion, um, there was just lots of uh, questions and comments and so forth from that group. And the final uh, resolution from them was that they would prefer that it be in the amenity zone, which is the position where things of this nature are intended to, to be placed. Uh, benches, trash cans, lights, all those kinds of things are planned for the amenity zone itself. And so through that process, um, that was their recommendation. We moved it to that position, and then uh, it has gone on to the Board of Adjustment as well. well my concern is, and I seldom disagree with Mr. Box, I think he's a good thinker, but I think this would be presidential. I think it would cause some issues. Uh, everybody who would look at that sign would have similar unique problems to deal with. And uh, I, I'm afraid if we uh, it was approved, we would be faced with uh, uh, revocable permits all over town for signs like this. I would only offer one other comment about this. Um, if you were to study the photograph real carefully, you would realize that there's not a square inch of the Buick building that doesn't have some beautiful um, stone carving in it. And so that's what makes this condition uh, very special. I have had the benefit of serving as the design uh, review committee or part of that for Automobile Alley for some 15 years. And this is the only instance where we found um, where it was a different circumstance. We've approved signs on lots of buildings on Automobile Alley. This is a very unique situation, just like the Daly Oklahoman building would be uh, to the south of this building as well. So I, I'd like to think and, and hope that you would be convinced that uh, this is a very, very unique situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to preserve a very important building in downtown. Building. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess if I could maybe uh, tack on, make a couple of comments about this. I also have worked on Broadway uh, with Rand and with others for about 15 years. And I actually think this is one of the most creative solutions to a really unique problem um, that we've seen. And Pat, with regard to precedent, um, I think there are very few places in Oklahoma City that would meet this criteria to begin with. The street is so wide, the sidewalk is wider than any sidewalk that I'm aware of. Um, and allows a unique amenity zone for this. We already have in that strip a park bench, a trash can, and a bus stop bench. So it's not uh, in a, <laughs> well, there's, there's plenty of room in front of the building to place the sign. It, um, you know, it, it has been through the standard design process. It was approved by the Downtown Design Review Committee. It has been granted a variance by the Board of Adjustment, and anybody else that wanted to place a sign like this would have to go through the same process and go to the Board of Adjustment. So these kinds of decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, I, I was going to make a similar comment to the one that Rand made um, along Broadway over these 15 years. We have, as a group, encouraged signage, and we've encouraged neon signs, and most of those are on buildings. Um, but this is a very uh, specific, unique example. Um, that I think merits our consideration uh, have, have, for this. If we actually, I know Dennis was holding it up. Could we see the sign as it's going to be? Sure. Yeah, is that the picture you have? Could you pass that one around? And other comments? Yeah, Brian, go ahead while we're passing well, it around. Well, you know, I, I'm, I wish every member of this council had the opportunity to uh, bask in the glory of owning a retail business like I do. Um, it's, it's difficult. Um, people have choices, and if you make it difficult for them to find your place, they have alternatives and they will find those alternatives. Um, I understand preserving the building, uh, but the bottom line is, is that businesses need signage. And this push of, of this council and of the city to be anti-sign every time we turn around, uh, we really need to get over that because the, the economic driver of the city is sales tax and we, we tout economic development every time we turn around. And economic development starts with the small business, the, the small location. And those locations don't have a ton of money to advertise and to be on TV every time you turn around. They need signage. They need people to be able to find those buildings and those spots easily so that they can continue to build up their clientele and remain in business for the long term. So 
looking at the sign, I mean, that is a very, very clean sign. And whether it's in the amenity zone or any of the other stuff, uh, the idea of, of, of that business having a sign, I think, is, is very, very appropriate. And it's, it looks very, very clean and acceptable to me. And uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, Mayor, mm -hmm. you know, I, the, the issue of whether or not this sets a precedent if, if we approve this, I think that the, the whole purpose of the De Downtown Design Review Committee was established to have individual considerations as it relates to these type of issues in a particular geographical business area. And to some extent, that is the purpose of, of the design committee is that, you know, there will be situations and, and projects that they, they can approve that they wouldn't approve in another situation. And I, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, if we, if we put everything in a, in a cookie sheet, you know, cut out program, then what would we have in this city? So to some extent, we have to be a little bit different and allow some, some variances. And, you know, that's the whole, whole purpose, I think, in the definition of variance, and we do it all the time. Now we have uh, something of, of probably one of the most historical, you know, buildings in this city that relates back to nothing but true, true history of the automobile uh, industry that we happen to have here that was built by the industry. And now the, the preservation of it has become a icon of a restaurant in the state of Oklahoma and in the city of Oklahoma City. And to just to be able to have the, the additional uh, drawing of, of customers to, to be able to see without having to deface the, the true historical architect of this building, I think would be a travesty uh, to, to the business person that's involved in this project, to those individuals who took on the courageous uh, project to, to restore this building, to, to add to, as Brian say, to, to the business of the city of Oklahoma City. And, uh, you know, I think we have to be respectful to those committees, uh, the, the Board of Adjustments, the Design Review Committee. Obviously, when they looked at this, I'm sure they took as much uh, into consideration as it relates to what would everybody else want to do on, on Broadway. And, and pardon me, uh, Councilman year that I don't refer to Automobile Alley too much, but, but it is still Broadway to me. And uh, so to that extent, I think that, that we would not be uh, doing any injustice. Uh, I think we would be doing an injustice by, by not allowing this to, to go forth for, uh, um, for the business as it is and to and the, the, the maintain the preservation of this historical building as it presently is. And, you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about Broadway because 15 years ago, you know, just like downtown Oklahoma City, you know, we all know what it looked like. And, uh, and to see it come back now and to be able to, to be a part of, uh, of, of the continued redevelopment of that area, I think it's, it's amazing that, that you know, what they have been able to do. And, and so I think this is something that, um, that we should take serious consideration towards the approval of this. All right. Any other comments before we ask for a motion? Yeah, Gary. Well, I, I just feel like I need to make a uh, comment in support of staff because I think that they will tell you that they are concerned about the precedent-setting nature of this. And it's not just Automobile Alley that we're talking about. It's any of the areas that um, a business downtown might want to put a sign like this in this amenity zone, it's called. Uh, and I think that um, even though the, the Urban Design Committee reviews items one by one and the items come to us one by one, it does set a precedence in, in the committee and the Board of Adjustment and this council is going to be hard pressed to deny any in the future when you, if you allow this one to go in now, because it, it, how, how do you tell one business owner that they can't put a sign up when you let a, another business owner do the exact same thing in the exact same zone on the sidewalk and so on and so forth? So uh, I, th I think it, we need to understand 
uh, the, the precedent setting nature of it. Uh, Rand, I have a couple of questions if you don't mind. On, just on the logistics, I'm not an engineer, so bear with me. Sure. We're an architect, either one. Uh, is there not a way to put a mounting structure, a freestanding mounting structure, on the north side of the building that would allow the sign to project out over into the sidewalk area? Good question. Um, the downtown is a series of 25 foot lots. And the Buick building is two of those lots. There's two of those lots next to it. And they literally sit on the property line. Um, the, uh, the hope and the desire as time goes forward is that the lot between uh, the Buick building and the Markham building will be developed in some way, that there would be a building, an insert, something built in that particular point that would go from property line to property line. So if anything attached to the north side of the building would be an encroachment and would ultimately have to come down at some particular point. And there's a hope that that development uh, will go forward sooner than later. What about coming off the roof of the building with some kind of a mounting structure? Is that is that out of the question too? I know it doesn't doesn't give you the Rand Elliott look, but it, is there a way that the, a sign could be in front of the building that's that's mounted on off of the roof structure? Um, anything is possible. Um, I would just say that there's a very important uh, quote that. Um, we often use that was actually created by Ron France, who actually uh, is the Main Street person. And it's a great quote that might be of value. And he says that buildings have signs, signs don't have buildings. And I think it's a very important point to understand um, the appropriateness of, of, um, of placing or attaching um, an individual object to a building itself. If it looks strange, if it feels inappropriate, then it it actually becomes a, a detraction rather than an amenity or, an, or something good. And so um, I can promise you, Gary, that we have we've worked this really hard in every imaginable way in terms of position, how we would do it, historic precedents, all those kinds of things. And we really believe that this is the best solution for this circumstance. Okay. Yeah, Meg. If I could just make one other quick comment, I think it's important to note that this uh, revocable permit does include a special uh, provision that I haven't seen before, which specifically says that if um, if the city makes a request to remove the sign, the sign will be removed and the sidewalk will be returned exactly the way it was um, at the owner's expense. So we have very little uh, at risk here by allowing this special uh, permit to go forward. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, just one comment on the on the question about precedent. Um, uh, I would agree that it may be a precedent if you find another situation that is uniquely like this one, exactly this one, well, then that person would have a precedent if they could find one. It's my understanding that you can't find one, that, that there is not another structure or certainly not enough other structures in, 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 along that area for this precedent ever to be exercised. I mean, in the law, the precedent's got to be, it can't be that somebody else has a sign, so therefore I get one. It's got to be that someone has a sign be caught that, that's located in a certain place uh, it, for under certain other circumstances, and then there's the precedent. The pre precedents aren't just general. I mean, because one guy gets to move, move a mobile home onto his, um, his five-acre tracts for his mother-in-law to live doesn't mean that everybody can. You still have to go through the process to get it done, and that's what I think sets this one apart. And, and so... Uh, I don't think this sets a precedent that we have to worry about unless there's another building of, a, of a historical nature that has the design, has the kind of a front facade that this one does, that has a amenity zone in front of it. I mean, if, I guess we could find another building like that. Maybe this would be a precedent. But I'm hearing that we, there, there are very, very few, if any, other buildings that are going to be historically going to be or, or, or there's going to be the ability to use as a precedent for this sign location. And coupled with the fact that it is a revocable permit, that is that we control totally over how long it's there. I mean, they could be, we could ask that it be t taken down as soon as it's erected if we didn't like it. Um, I, don't, I, I, think, I think it's, I like it. I mean, I looked at the picture. I, I don't agree that the precedent is a problem, and I think... Um, I agree with what Brian says. I mean, businesses have to have signs. I mean, the, 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 especially in the kind of market we have right now, uh, people don't know who you are and where you are. You're going to have a hard time sustaining the business. We may have a couple of haunted houses in 
Oklahoma City that are being able to sustain themselves without anybody knowing where they are. But the fact that we know, I know one that did that makes it shows how unique a business is that can survive without signage of some kind. Mm -hmm. So I'm 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 in I'm in favor of it. If, if Mr. Uh, if Councilman Kelly wants to move approval, I would second it. Sam. Sometime, uh, Mayor, we ought to have the uh, discussion about what, what is it about signs in this council that just has a way to arouse the interest and, and emotions and opinions of all of us, unlike <laughs> any other subject uh, we seem to discuss. You know, when we talked about Devon and the TIF, uh, about the precedent-setting nature of, of that TIF, I, I remember specifically, almost unanimously, to this council, if we're going to set a precedent, as Devin did, that's the kind of precedent we need to set. And I think that's what we're looking at here. Certainly, we set, pre we set precedents all the time. And if we're going to set a precedent, if we're going to do that this morning, uh, this is the kind of precedent, the kind of standard, I think, that we want to set. Okay. Any other comments before we ask for a motion? All right, Skip, you'll make a motion. I, I move that we uh, move this for passage. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. All right, we're on to item 8F, and I understand we do need executive session. Yes, sir. All right, how about a motion to? All right, cast your votes on 8F. That item is moved to executive session. Item G, I understand we do not need executive session. Okay, we need to vote on that. We do not need to vote on 8G. All right, on to 8H, I understand we do need executive session. Yes, sir. All right, cast your votes on 8H. Passed unanimously. All right, on item nine, these are items from council. Pat, you want to get us started? Uh, just a, a brief comment. In the papers this morning, there was an announcement uh, of, of the loss of a uh, longtime Oklahoma City leader, Marion DeVore, died. At 87 years old, uh, she was active in the arts community and active in just about everything else good in Oklahoma City for a long, long time. And I, I think it's, uh, it would be appropriate for the council to prepare some kind of resolution uh, commending her uh, for, for her long years of service, uh, recognizing her for her long years of service. Okay. Consider that done. Skip. Meg? I'd just quickly like to echo Pat's comments. I saw that this morning in the paper as well. She was an incredible role model for me, and I'd just like to express my condolences to her family. And um, all of those that had the opportunity to work with us were really blessed by Marion's uh, generosity and spirit, and uh, this community will re really miss her. Okay. Bye. I want to draw people's attention to the front page of the Oklahoman today. A nice story on our police officer who was shot uh, in the line of duty uh, this week. I had the opportunity to, to meet him Sunday night at the hospital. And a remarkable young man uh, with, a, with, a, with a very interesting first-person account of being on the front lines and dealing with an extraordinary situation. And I, uh, I think he represented us well throughout the process. And uh, our, our prayers are with him as he recovers. I think uh, all signs are, are are very favorable. He's going to have a full recovery and be back on the force very, very soon. Uh, Pete? I was going to comment actually on the police officer myself, and I appreciate those comments. I second that. Larry? Sam? Mayor, as we recognize the outstanding commitment of our street crews this morning, I, I want to point out to um, an another group I, I, I feel recognition is due. We we've been uh, Meg and, and, and Pete and I, the city manager, have been meeting with the Homeless Alliance group for some months now in, in trying to get this facility jump-started. And they did jump-start their operation at the request. They're out at uh, uh, Northwest 3rd in, in uh, Virginia, the Homeless Alliance uh, proposed day shelter. And at the request of the major shelters this past week with, with the extreme cold snap, uh, they opened and uh, moved, moved their pilot operations ahead with Thursday, Friday, and Saturday operations. Um, Thursday, they had over a couple of hundred people there. This is daytime only. I stopped in Friday and visited with them. Uh, it wasn't quite that large a crowd, but it was very well organized. Uh, I think we, ought to, we can feel some confidence about this group now in, in moving forward. They've actually had their feet in the ground on the ground and um, uh, ex uh, with five or six uh, entities there uh, serving the, the, the people. Our, our police department was there. 
mental health people were there, uh, legal aid, traveler's aid, a, a variety of our, and our, our uh, health group, Helping Hands Health Center people were there. A real opportunity to see this group begin on these, under these emergency conditions. And without incident, in those three days, I don't know whether they operated yesterday or not. It was just, I, in my opinion, extremely good start and some confidence in them that I think uh, we've all wanted to feel as, as we move forward with them. It was, it was a good, really good response under, under similar uh, uh, emergency conditions. I applaud them. All right, Gary? Well, just uh, I'll reiterate some of the comments already about the police officer and the outstanding work there. And, and I concur with uh, Pat Meg on Marion DeVore. A lot of people, although Marion's accomplishments in the community go throughout numerous organizations, my, my uh, uh, involvement with Marion and, and where I know her best was from the Festival of the Arts. And, and if you enjoy the festival the way it is today and the food court the way it is today, you got to understand that Marion started that many years ago by begging local artists to set up displays in Civic Center Park and making sandwiches at home to sell at the event. And that's, that's how the Festival of the Arts got started many years ago and has evolved into what it is today. So I, I think uh, uh, a, uh, a resolution from council is certainly fitting. All right. Um, Legal has come forward with a request on item 6E. Uh, it's come to our attention that that, probably, that item should have gone to the Water Trust before it came to us because it is Water Trust property. So unless there's considerable uh, conversation that needs to take place on this, I need three motions, one to reconsider, one to rescind, and then a motion to strike, item 6E. Motion to All right. Cast your votes. Reconsidered. Motion to rescind. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And a motion to strike. All right. Cast your votes. Item is struck. We good? We're good. All right. We have executive session. Well, first we have city manager reports. Uh, there's two city manager reports in your, in, in your uh, packet today. One is the uh, summary of the vacant positions that Mr. Bowman requested uh, last week. But also we do have a, a, a summary of a response to the, the Christmas Eve snow um, event. And I do want to thank Mayor and Council for bringing down the street department uh, to recognize that. And at the time we put this report in Friday, we did not have the final numbers on, on, on the snow event. We should have more numbers finalized this week on it as we put it together. But as we go and recognize people, I think it was just totally appropriate to bring the street department down this morning. There are a lot of people that got left out and that need to be, I, I think, at least mentioned. And um, when you start this, there's already, you're, you're going to miss a, a lot. But, but general services uh, should have been in, in the report. They certainly brought uh, people in and worked overtime to, to keep the fleet going. We've got a fleet that was out there working, but it was general services that kept them going. But there's also a lot of unique other stories that are out there. For example, the, the police department, a lot of them stayed over on that second shift. On that first shift, at, at, you know, Bill made, the, the chief city made that call in the afternoon to ask those people to stay over. So instead of going home on Christmas Eve, a number of the police officers uh, stayed over and, and uh, worked late into, into Christmas Eve because of that. Some couldn't get in and because of the number of calls and number of, of, of need for police officers we had during that time. We mentioned the police, the fire department in the, in, the, in the story. There was a lot of extra work that they did uh, serving at that point in time. Um, there are examples of, of, of people coming down to keep the court system open. They couldn't get down and stayed and worked extra hours and extra hours to make sure that the courts were still functional. The same thing at at, at, uh, at the communication center at 911 to make sure that we had people there, that we had, we had extra, extraordinary services. If you can just imagine the volume of calls that they were getting during that time frame and not having able people to come in or relieve other folks. There was just a, a, a lot of folks across the board. Water department had folks that couldn't get in and other people stayed over to make sure that the water plants were, were operational and people could respond to calls. And not known to many, but now the water, now is the water department's work. Now that we had all the cold weather and the frost is coming out of the ground, the water department had over 400 calls for service over the weekend of folks that had private service lines that were, were broken and a number of small water lines and a few large lines, but generally small water lines that were broken over the weekend. So their backlog is very heavy right now as they're responding to that. The solid waste folks that, that you know that, that had issues that came off not able to get there and, and, and how difficult it was for them to, to perform their tasks. When we get these type of weather events, it, it isn't just the folks that we recognize this morning, 
but there are a lot of folks that are dedicated. I mean, who would have thought we would have had an issue last week, and I don't know if you saw the press release on this, but we had a problem with the garbage freezing to the trash cans. And so there's a lot of things that, that, that come down the line that we have to respond to as, as we do this, and it is not business as usual when we respond to this. And here we are now over two weeks after the event, almost three weeks after the event, and now we're just starting to still deal with some of the things like the water main breaks that are finally thawing out and, or the frost is leaving and the water main breaks are, are, are starting to occur. So there's, you know, an event like this has far-reaching events beyond the, 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 the three or four days when, when we actually uh, uh, suffered the storm. So I, I just want to really again thank all the city employees that did a yeoman's job, you know, and, and, and just volunteer to step up to do that extra work that needed to be done during that time. Don't forget the airport. Yeah, well, the airport's mentioned in the report, but absolutely, the, the airport uh, uh, certainly did uh, uh, a lot to keep it open and some unique things there when they, when they, they called and, and worked with, with Homeland Security to open up, to, to take down the, the security gates and, and open, totally open up the airport. And then they had to, to, to empty out the, the concourse the next morning and screen it. And they did that so that the people that were stuck there would have amenities, could get in and have food and restrooms and, and everything else that they needed. And, the, you know, even just the restaurants staying open later, the private records that came out. I mean, people just abandoned their cars out the airport in the, in the, in the lanes out there, and it was actually totally gridlocked. Yeah, you know, we, as hard as they tried, they couldn't keep the runways open because of the amount of snow that came in, and we had to actually shut down the, the, the airport, which we do not do lightly. That was, that was a tough decision to do that, but then they got it cleared out, out and were able to open it the next morning. And the people who was letting everybody know the public information department, <laughs> Yeah, it just goes. You're out. Awesome. Absolutely, it yeah. just goes on and on. The number of people that right. emergency <laughs> management folks. Uh, mentioned in the court system, uh, Mr. M Manager, um, it's come to my attention that there may be a closing of the counter uh, in February after twelve o'clock, yes, seven o'clock. Yeah, we're, we're limiting the hours. That was one of the. I'm sorry, that's one of the items, budget items we discussed last week, was, was, was uh, minimizing the hours of operation of the court system. Can we revisit that issue? I, 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 I wanted to, to, uh, to bring out some issues that I think that maybe not what's not taken into consideration as it relates to, to individuals who may have a, a traffic citation that could cause them to be arrested after 7 o'clock and just because of a, a traffic citation or a failure to pay a, a fine, they could be held there for almost 24 hours for something that could have ordinarily been taken care of just at the counter. And I wonder if we could look at this, if, it's, if it is a major budget issue, if we could look at it from the point of view that a lot of those bonds could possibly be coordinated with the sheriff's department, since that's where we're contracted to hold individuals. Why don't I put an item on next week and we can, okay. we can discuss right. that. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We have a citizen who signed up to be heard. Uh, Annie Salas. Good morning. Thanks for your patience. We will need your name and address for the record. Um, good morning, and first I would like to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you. My name is Annie Salas. I'm a registered nurse and was formerly employed with OU Medical Center as a case manager. I took a home study course in non-emergency medical transportation because I saw on my job that there is a tremendous need for this type of service. Um, I contacted the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, the de police department, Secretary of State and asked questions about licensure for this type of business. And I was informed I needed to be certified through the Secretary of State and I needed to be licensed through the Department of Transportation, which I did. And I have everything compiled here, should you guys want to see it. Uh, last week, a Sergeant Ricketts with the Permit and ID section of the Police Department called me and stated one of his coworkers had seen my business van and found that I was not licensed with Oklahoma City. I turned in an application last week, uh, which was January 8th, to the Oklahoma City Licensing Department and was informed that since I had gotten everything in, I would be put on the Traffic Commission calendar for January 22nd. Um, I am the only source of income for me and my adult disabled son. And I come to you today 
to I'm just trying to figure out what to do. I've resigned from my job. I have no source of income. And I've been told that I have to wait um, for the, the January 22nd calendar date, which is close, but that I would have to wait until February to meet with the city council. Uh, that's a piece of the licensure. And I was just wondering if I could um, have permission for today to be my meeting with the city council. And then I would only have to wait until January 22nd to present uh, in order to get a license to work. Um, Bob, you want to shed some light on this for us? She's requesting a certificate of public convenience and necessity. It goes to the traffic commission on the 22nd. They make a recommendation that it comes to the council. It's my understanding it would be here the 2nd of February. Um, there's really not any way through the ordinance that we can modify those dates. Um, she's made the application for, with the supervisor of licensing, and we've reviewed it, and we've, we've set it for the 22nd. But that's really all. We don't have any administrative flexibility on this kind of uh, certificate. And I'm not trying to. I'm grateful for everything. What I'm asking is, um, since my meeting with the city council will be in February, if it at all possible could today be the day of the meeting with the city council. Kenny, do we have any discretion on that type of thing? Well, no, it, it can't really, today really can't be the meeting before the city council. It's not even on the agenda. The council has to approve it. It has to be on the agenda to comply with the Open Meeting Act, and they don't have any of the documents in front of them. And under the code, I think it's supposed to go to the Traffic Commission first for a recommendation before the council makes it, makes a decision. So it really has to go to the Traffic Commission first. And since there's only there's only one Traffic Commission meeting a month. Is this just a matter of procedure, or is there, Bob, in, for the information that you have as it relates to, to the business, is it just a matter of that it just has to go through this timely procedure? Are there questions as it relates to, to the business itself? She, she submitted an application, and there, there are some things that ha have to be included. Letters of recommendation are part of that. And we've reviewed that, and it's a complete application, so we'll set it, we've will set set it. we set it for Traffic Commission. Um, I talked to Stuart Chai traffic, with Traffic Management, and... Their review will be, it will be an item on their agenda. You know, I don't know how detailed their review is, but since their, her application is complete, uh, he felt that most of the time those are recommended for approval and sent to council. Um, what, is, what are the ramifications if she continues to operate her business until that date? Well, um, she, they told me. I can, I can get arrested. I can be charged as, with a misdemeanor. Uh, my driver's license can be revoked. And since I am a registered nurse, if you do anything, you know, that could challenge my professional license as well. That's why I've tried to do everything, go to them, um, and, and I did everything initially, too. And for some reason, it just seems like I fell through the cracks because that's what was a part of my course to do research, even though I'm in the state of Oklahoma and whoever wrote the course is not my teacher told me to always ask questions, uh, find out if anything is any different, and that's what I did. I called all the places I knew to call, mm -hmm. and for some reason I just fell through the cracks. So it's you're saying amazing. that through the beginning of your application process, you, was una you were unaware that there was a process, an application, and a permit that had to be granted by the city of Oklahoma City. Yes, sir. So somebody just misled you with your application process. Yes, that we can't do anything about. But I know that. Okay. And so yeah. that's why I'm trying to do it. It, it doesn't good. sound like we have discretion on this item. I would say minimally we, we probably should in, in instruct the state licensing. When, when people do call, they need to be informed that they do need a city license. Bob, can you make sure that that happens in the future? We'll, we'll make that may, may just, yeah. Sure. May I just ask a quick question? Yes. As a licensed nurse, is there a possibility that you might be able to um, work with a temporary agency and get some temporary work? Of course. Work? I can do that. You know, it's more or less like, I, I just want to do the right thing. Yes, I can go get a job. Um, but I've exhausted all this money, um, blown my savings, and now I have to, you know, can't you utilize it. Well, I, we really, I, I really admire your um, 
uh, entrepreneurial spirit and your willingness to you know give up a secure job and go out and get out on your own and this I, I don't think we have any flexibility based on what I'm hearing to do anything but there is a window and there probably is an opportunity for you to hopefully continue some income between now and the 22nd and when it comes before council on the second does it sound like that you're concerned about this meeting replacing your requirement to as far as the traffic commission and then having to the the, the the application then has to come before has to be placed on our agenda. Is it about you having to come back to, to No, City I just thought when I called I called the mayor's hotline and told them what had happened and it was suggested to me that maybe to expedite things I could come today rather than waiting in February. They really didn't know. So, you know, since that was a possibility that's why I took this opportunity okay. to okay. come. So the traffic commission is on the twenty second? And that's a Thursday? Yes. It, it was changed because of Martin Luther King's. They're normally on a Monday, so it was moved to Thursday on this. So is that, is that the 21st? January the 21st? They told me the 22nd. Okay, so the traffic commission is on the 21st Thursday or the 22nd Friday. Which one is it? Do we know? I was given the date the 22nd. Which is a Friday. They put me on the calendar for the 22nd. I haven't checked the agenda. I was going with her, what they okay. called her. What, what I'm getting at is we have a, a council meeting the following Tuesday. It's a work. Hmm. Anyway, I do appreciate you all allowing me to speak. We can't do, we can't take care of this. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay, well. Would it be possible then, if she's heard on the 22nd, just to, to save her an extra week, could we have this as an individual item during the workshop to, uh, to go ahead and get that approved with an emergency? It's not going to save you a lot of time, but it would save you about a week. Maybe, yeah, about a week. Is that a possibility? Do you have a problem with that? We could do that. Okay. Is the workshop so what, here or are we all? No. Cox Center. Okay. What? The it's Cox at the Center. Cox Center. Well, we need to to give her the exact uh, yeah, was, information. Ma'am, we have her uh, information. Can we, we'll make sure somebody gets in contact with you and let you know it's going to be a little different than coming to the chambers. But Okay, but it's called the... Uh, it's a workshop that we're doing uh, over the budget, but, but we're going to add your item to that workshop. And so you would have to come to that location, which I believe is at the Cox Center. But we can do that. Okay. Thank All you right. so much. Any other citizens to be heard? All right, we have executive session.